The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a new student, Stefan, talking to an assistant, Anna, at the student union about his membership. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Hi, can I help you? Um, yeah, I hope so. Um, this is the first time I've been down to the Union. I'm a new international student and I just wondered what to do. Oh, right. Well, normally we ask international students to fill out this form and we put your details on the wall by reception. Then other students can contact you. It's a way for everybody to get to know each other. It can be a bit lonely otherwise. <laughs> oh, I see. What's your name? I'm Anna, by the way. It's Stefan Unger. OK. Well, just write that there next to name uh -huh. and then fill in the rest. All right. Um, what does it mean, degree programme? Oh, uh, just if you are an undergraduate or a postgraduate. Or maybe you're just here for a short course? I'm a postgraduate. Oh. Uh, do I need to say what in? Not really. It's too much detail. But you should put your department so people who have the same interests or problems as you can get in touch. So I'm studying marine construction, so... For department, do I put down the science faculty then? Uh, just your actual department. That must be engineering, no? Oh, I see, yes. Then if you list what you like doing in your free time, not that we ever get any when we're studying, <laughs> and maybe you can meet up with someone socially or to join a club or something. Well, I like lots of things. Shall I just list them? Um, my advice is to just put one or two, like football and films or whatever. Otherwise, you'll get so many invitations, you won't get any time to work. OK. I think I'll just list computer games, as that's my big interest. Oh. I haven't played football for ages. <laughs> I may start to play once I get settled. Now, let's see. Next thing is languages. Yes. We find many of the international students get a bit tired of speaking English all the time. Sometimes they like to speak to someone in their own language. It's up to you. That is a good idea. I presume I don't need to put English down. Oh, no. <laughs> I put um, Italian and French. <laughs> I can only speak German, my mother tongue. OK, well, that's fine. Just put that. Uh... What does accommodation mean? Is that my address? We're trying to find similarities between people and some people live in hall, some are in flats, some are in bedsits. So it helps if you say. I'm in hall, though I'd like to be in a flat, but that won't happen till the end of the first term. Put where you are now. You can always change it later. Uh, then finally, just put your phone number. I haven't really got one. I haven't sorted out a mobile yet. Well, it's going to be difficult for people to contact you then, isn't it? Mm. Why don't you put the union one and we'll take messages for you. OK. It's 02950659003. Have you got that? Uh. Yes. OK, then. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10.
Oh, I had a couple more questions about the services you've got here. Um, it says there's a photocopier here. Yes. You need to get a card from the shop, and then it's available to all students in the mornings. The union uses it after 1pm. OK. I see also the union organises loads of events. Are they always held here in the union building? It looks big enough. <laughs> if you're interested in something, you should check the poster or our website. In fact, we normally use the Round Theatre, opposite the Conference Centre, for most events, because the sound system is better. Right. I'll do that. Also, I wanted to hire a van. Can I do that through you? Um, no. You need to present a case, really. Oh. They're not just available for hire to anyone. Mm. The President said we have to limit who is allowed to hire them. The person you need to see is the Transport Secretary. She's on the second floor. OK, thanks. The other thing is, are all the discounts we get with our union card listed on the back of the card? I thought there might be more. No, that's it, I'm afraid. Mainly books, clothes and music. Though we are currently negotiating to get one on newspapers, so that should be valid from next term. OK. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour of a newly renovated health club. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Thank you all for coming to see the new renovations to the Hartford Health Club. I know you'll be as pleased as I am to see the wonderful results of our months of hard work to improve the club and bring you the best facilities ever. We'll begin in here with the swimming pool. You'll notice the new colour of the adult pool, a lovely cool green. Now walk over here and look at the children's pool. It's the same green, but as you see, with brightly coloured sea creatures painted everywhere. Both of the pools needed painting, not only for maintenance, but I think the new colour greatly improves the atmosphere of this part of the club. Next, let's take a look at the locker rooms. Don't worry, there's no one using them just now. Doesn't it feel roomy in here? We've expanded both the men's and women's locker rooms, so now they'll be much more comfortable to use. There are bigger lockers, a good deal more room in the dressing area, and more places to store extra towels and equipment. Be careful as you walk through here. The floor's just been polished and may be a bit slippery. Let's go up to the exercise room next. Here, you'll notice a new floor. Walk on it. Doesn't that feel comfortable? It's a special material, softer than the old floor, an ideal surface for jogging and exercising. They had to move all the exercise equipment out while they were working on the floor, but don't worry, it will be brought back in before the end of today. Let's step outside now and look at the tennis courts. We haven't done a great deal here except to the equipment. We replaced all the nets and the ball throwing machine, otherwise everything is the same as it was before. Let's walk down this hallway and here we are at the club store in its new location. We thought here by the entrance was a better place for it than where it used to be by the swimming pool. But it still has all the same items for sale, sports equipment and clothes in the club colours. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We're excited about the upcoming activities and events to take place in our newly renovated club. Now that the pools are ready for use again, swimming lessons will begin tomorrow for both adults and children. If you haven't signed up yet, you can stop by the office before you leave today and put your name on the list. If you're a tennis player, you'll be interested to hear about the tennis competition coming up on Wednesday. Players from different clubs all over the region will be participating. If you'd like to watch the event, tickets are available in the office. Also, I want to be sure you all know you're invited to our club party coming up next weekend. We're celebrating the completion of the renovation work and we have a lot to celebrate. The entire renovation project was finished in just nine months. That's three months less than the 12 months we'd originally planned on. We're proud of that and proud that we came in under budget too. Because we've had such good results with this project, we're already planning the next one. We already have two indoor pools, and next year we plan to install an outdoor pool right next to the tennis courts. Details of these plans will be made available to all club members soon. All right, I think we've covered just about everything. Are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact, introducing new styles of cooking. 
So you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So, are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay. Well, how are we going to organise this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table, and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago, and a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year, in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea! I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump. Round and all those names. So, how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak: for grilling, for marinating, and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries, I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast, and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a forty percent increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars. Health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. 
I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a student giving a presentation about some ways of dealing with the problems of urbanization and city growth. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, Adam's just been talking about some of the problems that have resulted from the rapid growth of cities in the last hundred years. Things like housing, sanitation, crime and so on. For my presentation, I'd like to look at some examples of what cities are doing to try to solve some of these problems. As part of its Healthy City program, the World Health Organization, the WHO, has come up with a set of criteria for a healthy city. The WHO says that amongst other things, a healthy city must provide a clean environment which is also safe. It mustn't be dirty or dangerous for its inhabitants. As well as that, the WHO says a healthy city has got to be able to satisfy its inhabitants' basic needs. That's all its inhabitants, not just the rich ones or the ones with jobs, everyone who lives there. A third thing, a third criterion, is that it's got to have health services which can be used by all the inhabitants and which they can access easily. The final point's to do with local government. The WHO says this is something that the whole community should be involved in, not just a few powerful politicians or businessmen. So, a healthy city is not just a matter of avoiding illness, that sort of healthiness. It's the way that the whole city works together for the benefit of its population. OK, so what I'd like to do now is to look at some projects in different cities around the world where cities have tried to meet these criteria, to make their cities healthy ones. Right. The first project I'm going to discuss took place in Sri Lanka and this project was called the Community Contract System. Its aim was to improve the places where the poorest section of the population lived, the squatter settlements. Basically, the problem was lack of infrastructure, things like drains, paths, wells for water and so on. So, a program was set in place to construct this infrastructure. But what was different about it was that the residents did this, the people who actually lived there, not people from outside. And this meant that not only did the people end up with improved housing and infrastructure, but also because they had contracts with the community, it improved their chances from an economic point of view. So that's the way the lives of people in one urban environment were improved. The next project I'd like to discuss took place in the capital city of Mali in West Africa. This project involved setting up a cooperative to try to solve the problems of sanitation in the old central quarters of the city. 
One of the main problems was a lack of a system for garbage collection, which meant that there were a lot of insects and this was causing disease. And again, it's interesting to look at who was involved in dealing with this problem. In this case, the cooperative involved students who had graduated from secondary school in getting a system going. As well as that, the cooperative set up a campaign to educate the public about the importance of good sanitation through showing films and setting up discussion groups among the local people, especially women and adolescents. And the outcome was an increased environmental awareness, which led to changes in household behaviour as well as improved living conditions. Okay, the third project was in Egypt, just outside the capital Cairo, which is a city that's grown very rapidly in the last few decades. This project was based in a women's centre in a poor area called Makatem. The aim of the project was to support girls, young women from the area from poor families. So these were women who had no education. They'd never been to school, so they were totally illiterate, and they had no chance of getting jobs. At the women's centre, they were shown how to sew and how to weave, and once they'd learned these skills, they were given the equipment, a sewing machine or a loom, so that they could make things to sell and have a chance of earning their own living. And this project has meant that these young women have greater status in the community. But as well as that, they can enjoy a better quality of life. So I don't think the problem is that cities are bad. This world and its cities have the resources to provide for the population that lives there. What it takes is a stronger will and a better distribution of resources. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.